Catholic missionary Mother Teresa once said, God has not called me to be successful. He's called me to be faithful. That is true of every single one of us, just as much as it was of her. You understand, God didn't call you to be successful. He called you to be faithful. And the reason he calls you to be faithful is because he is faithful. As we'll see later in our story today, Samuel, the great prophet and judge of Israel, says to the people of God at one point, fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart, for consider what great things he has done for you. 1 Samuel 12, 24. In other words, be faithful to God. Why? Because he is faithful to you. Which, by the way, has nothing whatsoever to do with being successful, at least not according to this world's standard of success, right? Uh, uh, certainly, if we're talking about the all-time most faithful people in human history, those first followers of Christ, his disciples without question, have to be a big part of that discussion, right? And yet, according to early church history, the apostle Paul was beheaded. Peter was crucified upside down. Thomas was run through with four spears by uh, soldiers in India. Philip was uh, whipped to death in Armenia. Matthew was stabbed to death in Ethiopia. Bartholomew was flayed to death. James, the son of Alphaeus, was stoned and then clubbed to death. Matthias was burned to death. Andrew was crucified on an X-shaped cross in Greece. John was exiled, of course, to the island of Patmos after being boiled in oil in Rome. And James, the brother of Jesus and pastor of the church in Jerusalem, was thrown off the southeast pinnacle of the temple for refusing to deny his faith in Christ. It was more than a hundred foot drop, yet he miraculously survived the fall, so his attackers beat him to death instead. Now let me ask you something. Were they successful? After being called and discipled by Jesus himself, filled and empowered by the Holy Spirit and sent out by the church, they were rejected, beaten, tortured, and brutally killed. Is that a picture of success? Is that what you envision when you think about what success looks like for your own life? No, I don't, I don't think so. According to the standards of this world, those early followers of Christ were not successful people. And yet without question, without question, they were faithful people. Because they understood that what God was looking for from them was faithfulness, not successfulness. And therein lies one of the all-time great misunderstandings of the modern church today. Because today, we equate being successful with being faithful. And as a result, you can become, uh, listen, you can become a wildly successful person who believes in Jesus Christ while living a woefully unfaithful life. Sometimes, I think, even without realizing it, because in modern church culture, we've come to view earthly success among believers as an indication of faithfulness. Yet God never called us to live successful lives. Again, at least not according to this world standard of success. No, he called us to live faithful lives. And in living that way, when we live faithfully for him, what we are promised is great blessings, which can come, of course, in many forms, some of which may very well be material. And yet often, often they're not, as seen all throughout biblical scripture, okay? It's important to remember that a faithful life in Christ does not always resemble a successful life in this world. A faithful life in Christ, it doesn't always resemble a successful life in this world. So be careful not to confuse the two because you can live a remarkably faithful life that looks like failure to the world. We need not look any further than those prophets and apostles and Jesus himself to see that. You can live a remarkably faithful life that looks like failure to the world. And yet on the flip side, you can experience tremendous success according to every metric this world uses to measure success. 
with little to no fidelity, faithfulness to God's actual calling on your life. And so it's important, it's imperative to faithfully answering God's call on your life that you don't confuse worldly success with godly approval because although those two things will certainly at times coincide with one another, listen, often they don't, right? Which raises some very important questions for us today. If God calls you to live a life that in no way even remotely resembles this world's definition of a successful life, Will you be faithful to live the life he's called you to anyway? If he calls you, for instance, to serve people who maybe don't always affirm you or respect you, or maybe at times they even reject you, will you be faithful to serve them anyway? Right? If God calls you to stay committed to a relationship or to a ministry or to his church, even when it doesn't make you feel the way that you want to feel, will you be faithful to remain anyway? If he calls you to work at something, to pursue something through prayer and labor that doesn't always provide for you what you think it should or, or what you believe you deserve, will you be faithful to keep praying and keep working to that end anyway? Because look, at times in your life, when you're following Christ, he's going to call you to all of that and more. And the question is, Will you be faithful when it's not what you want? When it doesn't feed your ego, when it doesn't make you feel the way you want to feel or give you what you believe you deserve, will you be faithful? Will you be faithful? Will you be faithful? Or will you walk away from that calling to pursue something else that offers better odds at being successful? These are questions that even the great man of God, Samuel, had to answer when it came to his own calling, as we're going to see as we continue our sermon series, working our way through the book of 1 Samuel, just as, listen, there are questions that we need to answer today as we respond to God's calling on our lives as well. So uh, let's pick the story back up where we left off last time and see what living a truly faithful life actually looks like. 1 Samuel chapter 12, we'll begin by reading the first five verses. And Samuel said to all Israel, Behold, I have obeyed your voice and all that you have said to me and have made a king over you. And now behold, the king walks before you and I am old and gray. Behold, my sons are with you. I have walked before you from my youth until this day. Here I am. Testify against me before the Lord and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Or whose donkey have I taken? Or whom have I defrauded? Whom have I oppressed? Or from whose hand have I taken a bribe to blind my eyes with it? Testify against me, and I will restore it to you. They said, You've not defrauded us or oppressed us or taken anything from any man's hand. And he said to them, The Lord is witness against you, and his anointed is witness this day, that you have not found anything in my hand. And they said, He is witness. So after Saul's great victory over Israel's enemy, the Ammonites, back in chapter 11, Samuel knew that the people would now begin to look to their new king for leadership instead of Samuel, which is why he says, referring to Saul, behold, the king walks before you, and I am old and gray, because the writing is on the wall for Samuel. He knows that a transition in power is taking place, and the age of kingship in Israel has begun, which he's making clear again by saying the king walks before you in verse 2, and if you keep reading the same verse, he finishes it with, I've walked before you, I've walked before you from my youth until this day. And that statement, that walked before you, referring to Saul and Samuel, is translated from the ancient Hebrew as meaning to perform a function on someone's behalf. In, uh, in other words, he's saying to them, uh, when he says, I've walked before you, it's not the idea that I've been on display before you all this time. No, it's the picture of a shepherd walking before his flock, guiding it and protecting it and providing for it and leading it on its way. So he says, I've done that for you my entire life until this day. 
and now it's time for someone else to take over that role. And yet it's not as if Samuel's going to ride off into the sunset to enjoy his golden years free from service to God's people because he's fed up and tired. No, he continues long after relinquishing his authority as their judge, he continues to serve them as a great prophet, as we'll see as the story continues today and indeed uh, throughout the rest of the book. And what is so remarkable about that is Samuel's faithfulness to continue serving the people of God after the way he's been treated by them. Remember back in chapter 8, the Israelites demand that Samuel appoint for them a king. We know that it devastated Samuel that the people rejected his leadership over them. In fact, uh, it hurt him so deeply, God had to console Samuel by telling him, hey, don't feel bad, pal, because ultimately they're, they're rejecting me as their king. And then earlier in the story, in the same uh, breath, it tells us that the people rejected Samuel's sons and leadership as well. And we know, of course, those guys earned it by being dishonest leaders. But just to think for a minute about how Samuel must have felt when the people he had spent his entire life pouring himself out for from the time he was a little boy, right? You remember when his mother dropped him off at the temple. He's been faithfully serving the people of God since. Think about how Samuel must have felt when those same people reject his leadership and his family in the same breath. And now, after the new king secures a victory over the Ammonites, they're elated to the point that Samuel knows he has to step back from being their leader, their shepherd, and take on a lesser role. And yet it has absolutely nothing to do with the lack of, of leadership on Samuel's part or, or lack of integrity or, or poor care for the people. As Samuel points out, as God is my witness, whom have I defrauded? Whom have I oppressed? When have I been hard on you? Or from whose hand have I taken a bribe to blind my eyes with it? Testify against me and I'll restore it to you. And of course, the people have no choice but to agree because he was right. You've not defrauded us or oppressed us or taken anything from any man's hand. And by the way, uh, when Samuel says to the people in verse 2 that my sons are with you, he was not saying my sons are still in leadership over you or with you. No, it's the opposite. He's saying, notice that my sons are not up here with me leading. They're down there with you among the congregation of people because Samuel had taken them out of leadership, their leadership roles as well, so that no one could accuse him of directly or indirectly defrauding the people. So here he is making his case after a lifetime of faithful devotion to the people of God. After pouring out his entire life for them, they've rejected his leadership, they've rejected his judgeship, they've rejected his family, and unimpressed with his decades of impeccable service to them, they're now panting after their new king, after one battle. Yet even after all of that, as much as it must have wounded him deeply, still as we'll see as the story continues, Samuel was faithful to serve God's people, which again, clearly had nothing to do with their favorable treatment of him. Right? They, they didn't always respond to Samuel the way they should have. At times they didn't honor him or obey him or follow him or even appreciate him, and yet he chose to faithfully serve them anyway. Why? Well, it certainly wasn't because the people he was serving made him feel good. It wasn't because they made him feel like a great success story either. No, quite the opposite. They made him feel like a failure. Thank goodness Samuel's service to God's people wasn't dependent upon how they made him feel in return for that service. You understand? Your willingness to serve God's people should never be determined by their willingness to respond favorably to you. Right? As far as we know... The great prophet Jeremiah spent his entire life serving God's people without making one single convert. He wasn't very successful, but he sure was faithful. And that's all that God required of him. Okay, the truth is, if you only serve where you are never rejected, if you only serve where you always have success among those you're serving, then you'll never serve in one place for very long. Because there will always be those, I'm telling you, no matter where you serve, there will always be those who will not receive what you're offering them. The hard truth of it is, when you serve people, even God's people, at times they're going to reject what you're offering. At times, those you're serving will not honor you 
or obey you or follow you or even appreciate you. And that's going to hurt. It's going to offend. It's going to wound you. And the question is, will you be faithful? Will you continue to serve faithfully where God has called you and planted you? Or will you walk away and look for something or someone new? Someone who maybe appreciates you more. Someone who responds to you the way you want them to or treats you the way you believe you deserve to be treated. Because listen, if your answer is to walk away every time you fail to experience the success you're looking for, whether that's in a relationship with someone or in a ministry or in any other pursuit in your life for that matter, then you might as well just keep on walking because you're never going to find a relationship or a ministry or any other worthwhile pursuit in your entire life that is devoid of failure. At least not this side of heaven. And I imagine, I imagine there are some of you here today or maybe those watching from home who are at this very moment contemplating quitting quitting that relationship you're in that God has called you to or, or that ministry he's called you to or that pursuit he's called you to. And the question is, are you going to walk away because you're not experiencing the success you thought you would? Or will you be faithful to continue serving the life he's called you to live? There are some who've probably already walked away. You've walked away because you weren't being honored or respected or appreciated in that relationship or ministry pursuit, whatever it was, and yet you have to understand God never called you to be successful. He called you to be faithful, and that's a choice that you have to make. By the way, when it comes to the church, the body of Christ, if you've been hurt by the church, well, first of all, uh, welcome to the club. Because we've all been hurt by the church, and if you haven't, it's okay. Stick around long enough, and you will be eventually. You will. You absolutely will. You just haven't been in the church long enough, so, so just stick around. I promise you, eventually something or someone will offend you. You know why? Because the church is full of human beings. And we are all, every single one of us, flawed, broken, imperfect people. And when you hang around flawed, broken, imperfect people long enough, eventually someone is going to hurt you. They're going to hurt your feelings. They're going to wound your ego. They're going to offend your sensibilities. I'm telling you, it is absolutely inevitable. And it is absolutely no reason for you to stop serving. And listen, uh, the fact that everyone at one point or another experiences Hurt in the church doesn't make it okay, right? It simply means it's a reality that we have to face as members of the body of Christ because of our humanity. It's a reality, certainly, that needs to be dealt with, and yet it is not a justification for you to stop serving. Why not? Because your calling and faithfulness to serve God's people was never predicated upon their favorability toward you to begin with. No, your faithfulness to serve God's people is determined by one thing only. God's faithfulness to you. And God is always faithful. 19th century pastor Charles Robinson said, success is the world's criterion of merit. Fidelity is God's. Let's keep reading, verses 6 through 18. And Samuel said to the people, The Lord is witness, who appointed Moses and Aaron and brought your fathers up out of the land of Egypt. Now therefore stand still, that I may plead with you before the Lord concerning all the righteous deeds of the Lord that he performed for you and for your fathers. When Jacob went into Egypt and the Egyptians oppressed him, then your fathers cried out to the Lord, and the Lord sent Moses and Aaron, who brought your fathers out of Egypt and made them dwell in this place. But they forgot the Lord their God, and he sold them into the hand of Sisera, commander of the army of Hazor, and into the hand of the Philistines, and into the hand of the king of Moab. And they fought against them, and they cried out to the Lord and said, We have sinned because we've forsaken the Lord and have served the Baals and the Ashtaroth. But now deliver us out of the hand of your enemies that we may serve you. And the Lord sent Jerubal and Barak and Jephthah and Samuel and delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side, and you lived in safety." 
And when you saw that Nahash, the king of the Ammonites, came against you, you said to me, No, but a king shall reign over us when the Lord your God was your king. Now behold, the king whom you've chosen, for whom you have asked, behold, the Lord has set a king over you. If you will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, and if both you and the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God, it will be well. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you and your king. Now therefore stand still and see this great thing that the Lord will do before your eyes. Is it not wheat harvest today? I will call upon the Lord that he may send thunder and rain. And you shall know and see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of the Lord in asking for yourselves a king. So Samuel called upon the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day. And all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. So in a sermon that closely resembles Moses' covenant renewal and farewell in Deuteronomy 29 and 30, Samuel recites for the people the historical events of the Exodus, uh, Sinai, and the entry of God's people into Canaan, which had really become sort of a creed uh, at the time. That was, it was often repeated on formal occasions in national assemblies such as this one. And to be clear, Samuel was teaching them the word of the Lord over and over and over again, which is why he says, Now therefore, stand still that I may plead with you before the Lord concerning all the righteous deeds of the Lord that he performed for you and for your fathers. In other words, let me remind you, first of all, of his faithfulness to you. And also that his word was not just for your fathers then, the generations before you, but it is in fact for you today. And then he points them to the covenant blessings for faithfulness in Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14, and the covenant curses for disobedience in Deuteronomy 28, 15 through 68. And then, then he does something that no one wanted or would have ever expected. He calls upon the Lord to send thunder and rain, which at a cursory reading uh, seems like a wonderful gesture by Samuel and the Lord to send rain during the wheat harvest. But that's not what this was at all. This was no kind gesture, not even close. You see, the wheat harvest, May and June, was the dry season, long after the rains had ended. And the fact was, the very worst thing that could ever possibly happen during the harvest season was a thunderstorm. Because not only were they incredibly rare in the dry season, leaving people unprepared to deal with them, but they were almost always disastrous. They would destroy all of their crops and usually cause deadly flash flooding. This was no kind gesture. Samuel calling for thunder and rain, God sending it was a deadly, serious warning of judgment upon the people if they turned away from God, which not only explains the fact that as the thunder and rain come down, all the people greatly feared the Lord in Samuel, verse 18. But listen, it also explains their response to that storm in the very next verse, verse 19. And all the people said to Samuel, pray for your servants to the Lord your God that we may not die. This moment was a moment of sheer terror as the people of God are given a glimpse of the wrath of God as Samuel called down thunder and rain from heaven, which seems like a really harsh thing to do, and it was. And yet it was also for their benefit because Samuel was unwilling to sugarcoat the truth in order to spare their feelings. See, the fact is, even after stepping down as their judge, Samuel was faithful to disciple God's people, and he did that by teaching them God's word. Listen, the happy parts and the hard parts, all of it. He shared the blessings and he shared the curses, confirming all of it with a display of great and terrible power. Listen, not because God wanted them to see his anger, but because he wanted them to see his faithfulness, his faithfulness to keep his own word. So he sent a storm in the middle of the dry season just so there was no mistake about the faithfulness of God to do what he promised he would do. And for Samuel's part, listen, this is the very picture of discipleship, teaching others all that he has commanded us, the happy parts and the hard parts. It's holding nothing that is of God back from other people for the sake of their feelings. 
It's teaching them about the reality and power of God, and then it's showing it to them. Okay? Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe what? All that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age, Matthew 28, 19, and 20. So our mission as the people of God is to make disciples, not just converts, by the way, right? Uh, Jesus didn't say, go therefore and make converts of all nations. No, he said, make disciples of all nations because conversion is something he does. Discipleship is something we do. And so evangelism is as important as it is, it's only one part of discipleship. It's obviously a necessary part, but it's only one part. And so when you introduce people to Christ and they respond to him, God saves them in an instant. And then there's discipleship, which goes on for the rest of our lives when we link arms with other believers and journey with them through life. And exactly how do you do that? Well, Jesus tells us, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That's the public proclamation of the gospel acted out in the greatest drama ever written. Water baptism as people come to salvation in Christ. And then the rest of the story, Jesus says, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. So we make disciples not only by introducing people to Jesus, evangelism, but by continuing to teach them all that he commanded, all of his word, the happy parts and the hard parts. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. That's the display of power that confirms the teaching. Jesus with us, in us, the power of the Spirit of Christ that resides and operates in and through us. This is discipleship. It's more than simple, simply introducing people to Jesus. And by the way, it's also more than um, simply sharing your testimony with others as well. This is important. And, and so hear me. As important and powerful as your testimony is, and it is. In fact, Revelation 12, 11, uh, uh, referring to the people of God, says that our enemy is conquered by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. So listen, every time you share your testimony, what God has done for you, you put the forces of hell on notice about what is coming in their immediate future. Okay, your testimony is very important and it is powerful, but it is also essential to the making of disciples that you understand that your testimony is not the gospel. Okay, so when you share your testimony, as good as that is, you understand you haven't shared the gospel because your testimony and the gospel are two very different things. Uh, your testimony is your story. The gospel is his story, which is why Jesus didn't say, make disciples of all nations, teaching them all that I've done for you. No, he said, teach them all that I have commanded you. Okay, if all that I do is tell my story, then ultimately I'll make followers of Rob. But if I want to make followers of Christ, then I have to tell them his story. I have to proclaim the gospel, and I have to proclaim all of it, the happy parts and the hard parts. And it's the same for every one of us. And so, of course, the question is, will you be faithful? Faithful to proclaim, to teach, to demonstrate the gospel in all its power to the people around you who, who are clearly not being discipled today in mass. Will you be faithful to tell them all about Jesus, regardless of how it makes them feel, even if people who don't like you, right? What about the people who don't like you? Will you be faithful to disciple them? The people that don't like you or vote like you or look like you or, or believe like you. What about the people who just don't like you? Will you be faithful to disciple them? Okay, not everyone likes Samuel. And their treatment of him at times proved it, but he kept on faithfully discipling them with varying degrees of success, right? Sometimes uh, there are times where they flat out ignored him. And yet as unsuccessful as he was at times, he remained faithful to do exactly what God called him to do. And the question is, will you? Because listen, the church, uh, at least throughout our lifetime, the church has been faithful, I believe, in telling people about Jesus and even introducing them to him. The modern church, I think, has been very effective in, in some places in making converts 
What I think the church has largely failed at in this modern age is the ongoing process of making disciples. And I say that because there seems to be an epidemic in our country today of churches full of people who profess faith in Christ and yet they have no clue what his word actually says about all that he commanded us, about how we're to live and what we're to believe and the value of human life and the sanctity of marriage and the reality of hell and the wrath of God and our need to die to ourselves so that Christ might be exalted in us and the absolute requirement that we lay our lives down for others. Listen, there are vast numbers disheartening numbers of professing believers today who will treat you like you're out of your mind if you even suggest that they actually follow the teachings of Christ. I'm talking about believers. Why? Because they don't know the teachings of Christ. The fact is we are living in an era of the church that is marked by a profound biblical illiteracy. And we are without excuse because even in the midst of this pandemic and all of its restrictions, the church has never been more free to gather and worship and study God's word together. Just ask somebody from China. Sure, at the moment, maybe we can't have 400 people or 4,000 people, but it can be with four other people six feet apart with your mask on, studying all that Jesus commanded you in his word. The truth is, we have no excuse for not being faithful to learn his word and to share it with other people. And so look, sharing your testimony and even introducing people to Jesus is a good start, but it isn't enough. You have to teach them the word of God. All that he commanded us, the happy parts and the hard parts, that's how you make disciples and then you show them the power of God working in your own life. And by the way, the number of people who respond favorably to his word, to his teaching, that part isn't up to you. That's between them and the Holy Spirit. Your job isn't to ensure success. Your job is to simply be faithful to the life he's called you to live, which is a lifetime of making disciples by teaching them all that he commanded. Catherine Booth, who along with her husband William founded the Salvation Army, she once said, we are made for larger ends than earth can encompass. Oh, let us be true to our exalted destiny. Let's finish the story for today. Verse 19 to the end of the chapter. And all the people said to Samuel, pray for your servants to the Lord your God that we may not die. For we've added to all our sins this evil to ask for ourselves a king. And Samuel said to the people, do not be afraid. You have done all this evil. You have done all this evil. He says, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. Do not turn aside after empty things that cannot profit or deliver, for they are empty. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you a people for himself. Moreover, as for me, far be it for me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you, and I will instruct you in the good and right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart, for consider what great things he's done for you. But if you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. And so as the storm bears down on them, the people repent for their sin. Samuel reassures them not to be afraid because even in their unfaithfulness, God remains faithful to his word to make them a people for himself. And yet at the same time, Samuel also understands the reality that human beings are prone to wander, to sinful behavior, to unfaithfulness. And so he says, as for me, Far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you, and I will instruct you in the good and right way. In other words, I'm going to continue discipling you, uh, not because you're faithful, but because God is faithful. And, and beyond that even, I'm going to continue to pray for you, to intercede on your behalf before God, which was by far and away the most powerful thing Samuel could ever do for them, right? Uh, apparently, he's able to call deadly storms down from heaven and yet he doesn't say don't be afraid I won't call down any more storms no he says don't be afraid because the Lord is faithful and because I'm going to keep praying for you and not because the people just asked him not because he was uh, feeling particularly amicable toward them we know he wasn't 
No, he just called down a life-threatening storm upon the people. That's not something you typically do to someone you're happy with. No, the reason he was committing to pray for them was because he knew it would be a sin not to. Why? Because the Lord cared about those people. And whatever the Lord cared about, well, that's what Samuel cared about. Okay, Samuel's commitment to pray for God's people had nothing to do with warm and fuzzy feelings toward them and everything to do with an overwhelming desire to please the Lord. Because even when the people were not faithful, God was. And because of the faithfulness of God, Samuel was faithful to pray for God's people. Again, it's not because he was happy about it. And, and uh, listen, he certainly wasn't feeling like his life was one big success story at this point. Not after the blistering speech he just gave them, but Samuel was faithful and he gave every, uh, he had every intention of, of keeping it that way because God had always been faithful to him. And so he cared about the same things that God cared about, including praying for these people, which had to be anything but easy at times for him after the way he'd been treated. And, and you know what? It seems like praying for people would be the easiest thing we could ever do for them. When in reality, I think praying for others is at times the most difficult thing we could ever do for them because our natural inclination is to pray for the things and the people that we care about the most, right? The truth is, if you could listen in to other people's prayers, you'd know exactly what they care most about in this life because that's what occupies their prayers, which always comes back, by the way, to people. If you think about it, when we pray about situations and circumstances, those prayers are never offered up for the sake of the situations and circumstances themselves. No, the reason we pray about different situations and circumstances is because of the way those situations and circumstances affect us and the people we care the most about, which means even when we're praying about situations and circumstances, ultimately, we're really praying about people. And the people we pray for the most are typically the ones we care the most about. So again, if you could listen into people's prayer lives, what you would find for most is that most people spend most of their prayer time praying for themselves because that is who most people care about the most themselves. And then it's usually uh, family, friends, and, and on and on. Of course, whoever else may make that list is probably someone they at least like or care about on some level because we pray the most for those we care the most about. And so what does that mean then for those people we don't pray for? That's right. It means we either don't care or we care very little. The problem with that is Jesus said, you pray for those who persecute you. He said, you love your enemies. Matthew 5, 44, he said, if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Matthew 5, 46, clearly, clearly we're supposed to love people we don't even like. We're supposed to care about those who don't care about us. Why? Why? Because God does. And we're supposed to care about the same things he cares about, which means being faithful because he is faithful. And I'll just tell you, as hard as it can be to pray for someone you don't even like, God will, God will often not only work through those prayers to change that person's heart, but he will work through those same prayers to change your heart too. In fact, if you're struggling with anger, bitterness, unforgiveness toward another person, I'm just telling you, the single most effective thing you can do for yourself to heal from that anger or bitterness or unforgiveness, the best thing you can do for yourself is to pray for that other person who hurt you. Pray that God heals them, that he helps them, that he blesses them. And through your faithfulness to pray for them, he will work a miracle in your own heart. Listen, even if your prayers are not successful in changing someone else, I'm telling you, they will always change you. Welsh minister and author Martin Lloyd-Jones once said, prayer is beyond any question the highest activity of the human soul. Man is at his greatest and highest when upon his knees he comes face to face with God. Okay? 
being faithful is not a feeling. And it's not based on our chances of success either. No, being faithful is a choice that we make that is based on the faithfulness of God. It's spending your life exhausting your time and talent and resources serving others and discipling others and praying for others. Listen, whether you feel like it or not, that's what it means to be faithful. And it's a choice that is up to you. And then listen, whatever success that may come out of that faithfulness, well, that part is up to God. For our part, we just need to continue to be faithful, knowing that a faithful life in Christ does not always resemble a successful life in this world. And that's okay. It's okay because he didn't call you to be successful anyway. He called you to be faithful. Which leaves us really with only one question left to ask. Will you? Will you be faithful? Let's pray.